Hello everyone, welcome back. This is lecture five of our computer vision course. Today we're going to introduce the image retrieval. More specifically, we're going to introduce the clustering by taking key means as an example, and then we'll introduce the framework of content-based image retrieval. Then we will introduce the bag of words. In lecture four, we actually uh, introduced how computer can use the feature extraction to convert images into vectors to represent the content inside that image. Uh, but how can we use this content? Let's recall where we started. We've been given a set of images there and asked to group them. We've figured out a way by representing the images into the feature space in which each of the image is a feature vector there. So um, we can just group them by drawing circles like this. That is to say that as long as we can represent images in the feature space, we can play with them. This actually holds to nearly everything we're going to learn in the rest of this course. In a more general sense, this actually applies to a wide range of topics, like you can do it with the text information, audio, videos, and other media and information as well, as long as you can represent them as numbers into the feature space. The computer can uh, play with them because it's readable for computers. We left a question and answered in lecture four. Can we teach computers to draw circles for grouping? Now we can answer that question. You know, to group the images is actually to make the circles as far as possible because each circle is a group. We need a group to as far as possible to each other inside that feature space. Well, at the same time, we need images inside the same circle as close as possible to each other because they are quite similar to each other. They're supposed to be similar to each other. This is in fact the idea of clustering. Clustering is a process for grouping things. Uh, what we need is to maximize the intercluster distance. That is means between uh, the groups. You, you need to maximize the distance between those groups. Those groups, uh, the, this is called intercluster. And this is called intercluster as well. And we need them to be as far as possible to maximize the distance between them. However, at the same time, we have to minimize the intracluster. Intracluster means inside that cluster. Those samples should have the minimal distance to each other, or they should have the greatest similarity to each other. Let's think of that inside the feature space. This becomes more intuitive immediately today. You see, uh, there are some groups there, and we call them cluster. Actually, what we have to do is to maximize the distance between those cluster, called intercluster. At the same time, we have to minimize the distance of the members inside each of the cluster. We call those distance intracluster. And so, so after that, uh, this is a perfect clustering. I mean, group samples inside that feature space. Um, as I mentioned, actually this applies to everything. No matter you're playing with the text information, the audio information, visual information, when, as long as they are represented inside the feature space, this algorithm can be applied to group um, the sample steer. Let's take one of the most representative algorithms in clustering, k-means, and it's actually one of the most popular one. So k-means were at the k actually means a number of clusters. So number of clusters. There, that means how many clusters we want. 
So at the very beginning, k-means will pick up a k clustering uh, cluster centers there. That means uh, it, that will be considered as a representative of the clusters. Then we will assign the rest of item to its nearest class center that uh, the initial one we randomly selected in the first run. And usually we're using uh, Euclidean distance to pick it up to evaluate if it's a nearest one. And though, then after that, we move each class center to the main of its assigned atoms. Uh, that is a re-evaluation of the center. You know, at, at the first row, you know, we just because we don't know where is the actual main, where is the actual center of clusters, so we randomly selected someone. However, after the assignment of members to its class center, we can re-evaluate um, uh, where the main is. Then we can repeat the step two and three uh, by assign those members again then re-evaluate the main again and that process repeat repeat until convergence that means there is no change of its main the reason is every time we are evaluate we are assigning the members and re-evaluate the main the main is supposed to move a little bit because it's not supposed to the real center uh, of that cluster and but every time it's approaching uh, that centers a little bit. Then uh, after runs and runs, and um, hopefully the main will be uh, at the centers of each of the clusters. That may sound a little bit abstract for you. So let's take an exact example on, which will help you to understand. Uh, let's see, at the very beginning, we, we got a lot of samples inside of future space. As shown here, we got a lot of points there. Um, so to cluster or uh, to group them into three groups here, you know, uh, you see here, we are setting the key equals to three. Um, that means we want three groups or we want three clusters um, inside of future space. And we got a lot of samples here in the future space at the very beginning. We don't know where, which one is the class center. So what we have to do is just randomly pick three of them there as the first set of assumptions. So this is what we have there. We pick the K1, K2, K3 randomly as the hypothesis for centers. Um, then after that, we can assign each of the samples to its nearest center. Uh, the hypothesis, uh, like what's shown here, we can assign them to K1. We can assign those samples to K2. And um, in the same way, we assign the other samples to K3. So, you know, after this, you could see that this is initial grouping results, and it's a hypothesis about the clusters inside that feature space. Um, then, what we have to do is to recalculate the center because you know the, uh, those three. The original K1, K2, and K3 is just our assumption. It's not necessarily mean the real center. So after assignment, we can calculate the mean. Um, uh, that means the more possible centers for each of the clusters, and at least you're supposed to get here to come to calculate or to compute the mean is actually quite simple. Let's see, we have those samples for each of the cluster. We got a set of uh, feature vectors there. For example, uh, here is for this sample, this row is for this sam sample, and so on and so forth. We got a lot of member samples there. We pull all the member um, samples together, and or where uh, you can see we are, pulling um, the 
sample feature vectors together here you might have different dimensions there and x y and you might I have other dimensions there so each of them is a number as their coordinate uh, are their coordinates inside that a feature space to calculate the main is quite simple you take the main of each column in this case uh, you calculate the main so that will be mx m y and m other dimensions so the k1 the new center is actually of uh, a new vector of those means so you have m1 m2 and m other dimensions so this is the main and this is more reasonable center for this grouping for this group so you can repeat the process for k2 and k3 as well so you have updated center in this step so you could see the center is now m moving to the new center by calculating the mean. And after you calculate the mean, actually um, some of the samples may not be the uh, uh, may not be assigned to its nearest center there. So in this case we have to reassign those members because the centers are moving so we have to recalculate the members and we have to do the reassignment there so uh, this is what happening and you could see that there are some samples are moved from one cluster to another cluster uh, you could see here uh, this is the one previously uh, it's being assigned to k1 but now it's being assigned to k2 and anyway samples are moving and this looks more reasonable right um, I mean compared back to our initial guess about this uh, uh, clustering uh, about the clusters um, this is uh, looks like more reasonable assignment for each of the uh, clusters then you could see there are um, three points actually has been reassigned uh, previously it probably belongs to different center but after the reassignment uh, it has uh, has been um, assigned to a new cluster and uh, then we after that we have to repeat that process but recalculate the main because we now have different groups there different clusters there from previous uh, step and this this is actually a new assumption and a new hypothesis about the clusters so we have to recalculate the center and then we reassign the members after uh, the center has been recalculated and re repeat that process again and again until the mean uh, doesn't move or doesn't move significantly usually we will set a threshold to evaluate how much it has been uh, moved inside that feature space if that distance of uh, that moving uh, is less than the threshold we think the result I had is converged so that's a final result of clustering in that case and like uh, you have seen here and in step two we recalculated the center and we reassign the members and here are some results from I'm here and you could see uh, we actually pick up uh, the images from there you could see for each row is a cluster it's perfectly assigned the uh, samples into clusters even you could see those samples are actually a little bit different like the mouse uh, are uh, has different orientations but uh, they are supposed to have a little bit different feature vectors inside the feature space but generally they belong to the same cluster and also for the car 
Uh, you could see the car has different orientation as well, and they have different background as well. However, it has been assigned to the same cluster and flowers as well. So, uh, looks cool. To help you understand what's happening inside that feature space, we have used a technology called TSNE. Well, it's a method for dimensionality reduction as uh, actually. So and the reason is we usually um, have uh, a high dimensionality uh, in of the feature space itself. For example, uh, it might be uh, 100 dimensions there uh, of the feature space, but uh, it's but for human being, the, uh, we can see at most three dimensions. So a TNSE can help us to reduce that dimensionality into 2D so we can see it as a picture. Uh, you don't have to worry about this um, TSNE. We will introduce in it in the tutorials. So anyway, here you just have to focus on the clustering result. You could see here some of the clusters distributed very well, like those green and blue. However, there are some clusters that doesn't look like distributed as we expected. The reason is, remember, there might be 100 dimension of the feature space. So that means this cluster might be high above this plane, this 2D plane. So that means the distance to other clusters are actually um, uh, uh, large. And also for this red one, it's probably in other dimension that far from this plane. However, by projecting them into 2D, this is um, the only possible way we can observe it. Um, okay, here you can see, and uh, uh, um, this is a quite intuitive way to observe what's happening into the feature space. This TSNE can be used not only for clustering and also for the classification and other topics as well. And it's a helpful tool and we're going to introduce it in the tutorials. Don't worry about it. And, and what I want to say is you have to think inside the feature space. It will help you to understand what's happening in between. Another thing worth mentioning is for those examples we're using Euclidean distance as a metric. But indeed, you can use different metrics like the cosine similarity we have introduced previously. And there are a lot of other distances you can employ to evaluate the distance between samples and or between um, the clusters. So um, that is just for your information which uh, by using different metrics, it may create different result. The clustering is also called unsupervised learning. The reason is we don't have to give the guidance. We don't have to, um, uh, we don't have to do anything when the clustering uh, is conducted. So uh, it's called unsupervised learning because there's no supervision from a human being. Um, anyway, just remember that we will get back to here uh, to this concept later. There's another concept called supervised learning uh, by contrast. So we will get it back. Well, grouping sounds fun. However, this is not exactly the way we employed it in I'm here. In I'm here, Actually, what we're doing is something like this. And every one of you actually uploaded one image as your token, which may contain something inside that image, for example, a car, a key. So uh, that's the content of that image. And that is also one are considered an indication of your identity. This is, uh, let's see, this is student one and student two might have another token there, which may contains an key there. So, 
And then every time you're trying to check in by uploading another image there. So we're, we're actually comparing back this image to all the tokens you've uploaded. So we are looking for the one which contains the same contents um, you uploaded. For, for example, if it's a key and it should be um, map to here and we know right now is uh, the student two is checking in so this is what we are doing we are retrieve the tokens from database rather than doing a grouping as you have seen and this process is actually called content based image retrieval because everything is based on the content and uh, CBIR in short. Let's take a look at the general steps of CBIR. So um, the, the either step zero, we will extract feature vectors for all images on file um, uh, in a database. And so every image can be re represented inside that feature space as one point or one vector there inside the feature space then uh, when user uploaded one image as a query um, for retrieving back uh, those samples on, on file we will do use some kind of metrics to calculating um, for calculating the similarity between the query and the target here the targets are those samples in in a database or on file so with the seminarity calculated we can prepare a ranked list um, usually we will prepare it as a descending order um, that means the target which has the greatest seminarity to the, that query will be top ranked in that list and the least seminar ones well, at the bottom of that list. Yeah, so this is a ranked list. So usually, uh, you should be familiar with this, like uh, when you're using the search engines and there is a ranked list there. And usually they are prepared uh, uh, based on the similarities as well. And then we can represent this ranked list to the searcher. Uh, it's like what you have seen in the search engines. So this is a general steps. Uh, these are general steps of CBIR. And let's see, so, um, let's see, let's think it inside that feature space. And uh, to calculate the seminarity, we can use the cosine seminarity. So it's like, Every time we, we got some um, uh, images inside that feature space already, and when user has uploaded one image, um, uh, let's see, it's here, the new image as the query. So it's been represented into a feature space. Then we can use seminarity to calculate uh, its distance to the other target images in the database. And for each of them, we can calculate the seminarity. Then we can rank those image as a list. So, so if you're using the cosine seminarity uh, to prepare the list, uh, it's just based on the cosine seminarity. Uh, if you're using the Euclidean distance to prepare the list, and uh, the rank list is based on Euclidean distance, so by using the distance, you have to prepare uh, the rank list in ascending order rather than the descending order. And here are some results from Amkir. You see in the first column, it's a query image. Those are the query image. And, and the ones after that query image at each row, uh, actually are uh, retrieved samples and the rank list. You will see that um, it makes a lot of sense because uh, those are the target we're looking for. Those are target we're looking for. And uh, these flowers are what we're looking for as well. 
Well, it sounds straightforward by preparing the rank list uh, based on the similarity between the query and targets. Um, however, uh, in previous uh, samples and in Amkir, we just have uh, not that many images. That will be fine by comparing the query target similarity sequentially, uh, one image by one image uh, in that manner. However, in most of applications, we got a large scale of targets uh, inside our uh, database. For example, the Google always proud of showing us that he, um, he has finished the search within milliseconds um, by searching over something like 1 billion items. If we are doing that one by one by calculating similarity for each of the item there, it takes a lot of time. So, is there a better way to do it? Um, the clustering we just have introduced it can help. Let's see and how it helps. To speed up that process, we can do an indexing. Uh, before the search has been done, or before actually the queries have been issued, actually. The idea is we can group the images as clusters and we can pick one from each cluster as its representative. Then uh, with that representatives, we can, uh, every time we're searching over database, we can do a course level comparison. That means we're comparing the query to the representatives rather than the whole data sets. And then we will target the top ranked representatives there and we check it back to its um, original clusters where you have more members for that cluster there. Then we can uh, do a fine level comparison to its all members inside those top ranked uh, clusters there. Um, because we have escaped the comparison to a lot of clusters, so the process can be speed up. This is what happening. So the indexing will be something like we have a lot of examples or targets in the database. We can do a clustering by initially group them into several clusters. There, those are representative picked up for each of the cluster. And actually we can do this multiple times. Uh, we can conduct that uh, clustering on the representatives to create representatives uh, for representatives. Then we have a smaller number of clusters. And uh, then we do the clustering again and again, and finally we have list number of representatives. Uh, those, uh, then those uh, image has been indexed because they belong to different uh, hierarchical groups there. So when once this has been prepared, we can we can um, it's actually a tree like the structure. We can use the trees like the structure uh, to do the retrieval at runtime or on the fly. This is what's happening. Um, so when we have a query, we compare back it at the root of that tree and we can locate some of top ranked representatives. Then we go back its cluster uh, down on one level. There are supposed to be more members there then we compare to those representatives and repeat that process to pick up the top ranked one and then we go a step further down uh, to that structure to locate more representatives there then finally we uh, reach the uh, the leaves of that tree and where we can compare in a, uh, in a more finer uh, uh, we, we can conduct a more finer comparison of calculating the seminarity to have samples. Here you could see we actually have scaped a lot of leaves there. We don't have to compare to them 
because they're supposed to less similar to the query. So this, um, uh, by doing this, the process can be speed up significantly. And that's the concept of indexing and search based on the indexing uh, structure. And you can see clustering, it's really helpful in this process. And this is a typical CBIR system. You could see here, um, at, we usually do the feature extraction at offline stage, and we uh, put the feature vector into the bank of database. And then at the wrong time, when the query issued, we extract the feature vector and then uh, compare them back to the indexing structure there. Then based on the index structure, uh, the similarity are used for ranking and preparing the rank list at the online stage. Okay, that is the CBIR, quite straightforward, but I think it's the easiest way to use the feature vectors. By doing the image retrieval, it will help you to understand what the feature vector and what the feature space are. Then, uh, but do you notice um, here we actually use the one assumption uh, uh, that is there's just one feature vector for uh, each of the image. So, uh, however, because we have introduced in feature extraction, some of the images may have multiple feature vectors. For example, if we're using the local features like the shift, and we uh, we will have um, a set of multiple feature vectors for each of that uh, image. Then how can we do the retrieval based on the multiple feature vectors? Of course, you can do something by um, a point to point comparison to calculating uh, to calculate the correspondence between images there, but it's time consuming there because there are just a lot of uh, points there, a pixel there, a uh, saved um, features there. Uh, it um, doesn't sound like efficient. Then we have to introduce another concept uh, called back of visual words. Visual words, simply speaking, will convert those multiple local feature vector into just one single feature vector. So we will we will be back to the assumption like there is only one uh, feature vector for each image. So we can calculate the similarity between images very easily in that case. Um, talking about the back visual uh, uh, words, we have to introduce the backwards. The backwards is an idea in, from a text domain or an LP domain uh, in which each of the documents is considered as a bag. Um, so the bag ha contains a lot of words. So we, uh, when we are doing that, we are actually um, um, looking for one feature vector for each bag. It happens in the text domain as well. For each of the documents, we will have a feature vector because uh, uh, it's not supposed to be word to word comparison when you're searching over documents. So we can uh, use that idea um, for uh, the image domain. The uh, image domain, we can consider each uh, image as a bag, like what's shown here. Because uh, in the local features, uh, for example, the shift, uh, which are representing a local details about uh, that image, so they can be considered as the visual words. Uh, so that's an idea uh, we borrow from text words. So we have the visual words. Uh, for example, we can use the shift. Every shift feature as a word, and we call them visual words. Let's see uh, how those backwards methods can convert uh, them into uh, convert multiple words into one uh, single feature vector. So what happening there is we are actually uh, using the visual words. We will find a set of visual words as the representatives. Then we will do a statistics on each of the bag. It's like a document. 
uh, we can um, calculate the frequency of each word, like what we are doing in the he histogram. Um, in the histogram, we're counting the number of pixels, but right now we're counting the number of words. Uh, if it's text domain, like um, we have a text word car, we will count, uh, we'll, we'll count how many cars um, appear in a document, but right now, here is the visual words. We will count how many visual words are inside that uh, image. Then this will give us a histogram. You will see uh, soon um, this histogram is a feature vector like uh, we have used so far. And then in that way, we can do this for every image. And then uh, we have a single feature vector for each image. And this is the idea of vagal words. And using that technique, we can convert image into one single um, feature vector where you, you could see if that word appears more frequently than other, uh, its contribution inside that final histogram will be greater than other words there. So, this backwards, this is fine. Uh, this final result of backwards, the feature vector can represent the local features well, and at the same time, it's because it's just one feature vector, it uh, will help helps uh, to speed up that searching process. Let's see how exactly backwards are doing. So the first step is we have to extract the features first. Um, for example, let's see, we're using a sift. We can uh, extract for each image a lot of descriptors. For example, uh, we probably, uh, when they see uh, this is for this, this is for this, this is for this, and this for this. We can extract for each image. Actually, we, we can do this for all images we have in the database. So in that case, those descriptors are not uh, just from one image. It's a pool uh, com composed of a lot of uh, local features of, um, of these images in the database. Then after that, we can do a clustering. We can put all the local uh, features together because they are all feature vectors. Then they span another feature, local feature um, space. And so here it is. Here is a, we can call them local uh, feature space. Space there. Um, one as we have been um, introducing so far, as long as we can represent things in the feature space, we can do the clustering because uh, there are just a lot of them. Then we can do a clustering inside um, that feature space for um, those uh, local feature, uh, feature vectors there. Then we can pick up for each of the cluster one representative like we have, uh, we have been doing so far. And then those most representative words uh, will be used to compose a code book or a dictionary sometimes we call. Uh, that means we have a code book of C1, C2, C3. Um, there, it's a code book. Uh, the reason is uh, the feature Vectors are usually even they looks like very similar, but it's a con it's in a continuous space. Um, so we it's not easy for us to count to count the words like in the uh, text domain. A car is a car. We can uh, count that word just based on how well the characters match to the words we are counting. But in the feature, uh, local feature vector, we can't do that because uh, those local feature are continuous. It's uh, always with little bit uh, variance uh, sometime because, for example, those 
there is my another feature vector perfectly uh, looks really similar to C1 but not exactly C1 so we have to convert this continuous space uh, representation into a discrete one so that's the reason we're picking up the most representative one to compose um, this code book then after that, once we have the code book, the most representative one, and every time when we have an image, an uh, image has been decomposed into a set of local features, then we can count words like to back calculating the seminarity of each word to those centers. And we can assign uh, them to the nearest center uh, we will, in that case, we will consider that words is a C1. It's, it has been assigned to C1. If it has been assigned to C2, it will be considered as a C2. Then um, we could con we could count the numbers of uh, visual words in that case. Uh, after that, we will have the histogram. For example, uh, if we just have three uh, words, visual words in the code book, we will have a, a three-dimensional space, a three-dimensional feature vector for each of that image. So here you could see after that we can convert each of the image into a feature, one single feature vector uh, rather than multiple feature vectors there so that the retrieval, the CBIR can be conducted use the local features. So here's the result. You could see the first column uh, is the query image. It, uh, they're from um, here as well. But using local features, you could see uh, it's matched very well. Um, and it matched very well. Even you could see here, this, this card doesn't match to the query, but the background match to them. Even they are taken by different people uh, from different viewpoints, but it has been matched because local feature, local feature represents the details because the details matched. And also for this car, it has been um, matched the car for sure, but at the same time, uh, even there are ways different background, they, they can be matched back to the query. So looks very well and compare them back to the histogram search i mean ser searching with the uh, histograms you could see uh, because the color histogram are actually a global feature global feature as we have introduced and overall those samples will be matched to uh, that query because overall the color composition are more similar uh, there uh, to the original one. Um, the reason I guess is there are some brighter part here and there are some brighter part here as well. They have been matched. Even uh, look at this example. This is exactly relevant image to that query, but you see, um, it doesn't like that brighter part making its composition different from the query. And these two stand out from there because they have the brighter part uh, which can be matched to the query. So this is a disadvantage of the global feature, uh, more specifically in this case, the color histogram. However, with the local feature, um, it, we don't have that problem. Uh, because the details has been matched back to the query and the background has been matched back to that query. And uh, you could see from here, it's actually the same query. And those um, are matched back very well. And the background has been matched back to there. Uh, so I make it, I make it makes more sense than using a global feature in this specific case. That's the BOVW. Okay, up to here, and that's all the content for today. But let me say something to avoid to mislead you. Even we have picked up CBIR as an example here uh, for today, but the purpose is to help you to understand the use of the feature vex, uh, vector better, because I think CBIR is using feature vector in a very straightforward way. However, to search image, 
um, the CBIR is not ex um, actually the only solution. When usually we can use the text-based uh, search. For example, when you're using YouTube, I, I think they rely um, um, based on the text more on the images there because uh, you have the keywords there for each video, you have the description there, and the annotation, or sometimes we call them text there for each of that video. This can be purely done with with a text search um, uh, methods rather than uh, using the CBIR. I think that's what is more um, um, more convenient. Um, CBIR can help sometimes. Um, so in some scenario when there is no tax information or the tax information is not accurate enough to conduct the tax matching, you can consider uh, the CBIR as an assistance or you can combine the tax information with the content information and together. And also uh, what we have introduced is in a low level feature, uh, our, uh, we call them low level because it's just some numbers. It doesn't carry any of the semantic concepts or semantic information there. But sometimes when one, uh, what we want are in the semantic level, we, we need if uh, this image contains a car or not, contain a building or not, that's the semantics we are looking for. In that case, we have to use the semantic based search method. And I will leave it for you because as I mentioned for many times, this is um, a computer vision course for beginners. We're not going into that detail. In case you're interested, you can search using uh, those keywords. And also those methods uh, can be combined together to generate the real uh, retrieval systems there. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and that's all for today.